When is a model steam engine not worth rebuilding? This is part 8, making the new inlet and exhaust manifolds, fitting these to the engine and giving the main bearings a slight tweak. This final episode mainly shows the engine test running on the bench. Was it worth the time and effort to rebuild this engine? I would say not, as it took a considerable amount of hours to get it from what it was to as you see it now. Initially I turned this job down and said that I didn't think it was worth rebuilding such a poorly made engine, but the customer insisted, and as the old saying goes, the customer is always right. Here's the final part. Here you see the engine with an exhaust collector fitted. I made the exhaust collector with a piece of 5 8 diameter brass tubing, silver soldered to a couple of pieces of machine phosphor bronze, which in turn was silver soldered to the flanges that mount on the cylinder. The inlet manifold is not yet fully made, so I'll just go through the process and you can see it in detail. Like the exhaust manifold, the inlet manifold is a brass construction, silver soldered together, and at the moment this component is in my acid bath, which is in the outer part of the workshop. And this acid bath, or pickle bath as it's usually known, gets rid of all the residue from the flux from silver soldering or brazing. Then it's over to the polishing spindle to polish up the part. And I don't use gloves because I like to see where my fingers are. Then I would finish off the part by hand with some brasso as you see here. This is quite labour intensive, it's a bit of elbow grease. And this of course is a shortened sequence, it took much longer than this. But in the end the component looks really nice and shiny. And when it's fitted to the engine, I'm sure you'll agree, it makes the engine look slightly better. Throughout this series about the rebuilding of this twin cylinder engine, I've been generally moaning about the workmanship, and I'm still going to moan about the workmanship. I could not let you see how I made these manifolds. It was literally holding the pieces of brass up against the engine and using a pencil to mark the brass and then drilling a hole, moving it along, looking, drilling another hole, because it could not be a precision component. It had to be made to fit the engine. The union adapter fitted to the inlet manifold is a 3 8 by 32 threads per inch union adapter. This will allow me to use quarter inch pipe, which is very convenient for putting the silicone rubber pipe on to run the engine on compressed air. Now the union adapter is fitted, it's time to give it a test run. It seems to run fairly quietly, even my quiet compressor is louder than the engine which is not the norm. And what's interesting is that the bottom end of the engine is not yet really tightened up. The main bearings and the big ends are just a gentle fit. I always do it this way to avoid any picking up on the bearings should they be too tight. Now I'm testing the reversing mechanism, which in the end I had to fit a bush to because it was far too sloppy. As you can see at the back of it, there's now a phosphor bronze bush fitted onto the bracket. When I speed up the engine, it rattles a little bit, but as I've said many times, this is not a very well made engine. And one problem with this engine is that the eccentrics are keyed onto the crankshaft, so there is no fine adjustment. If you look back through the series, you will see how badly made some of these parts are. The valves being no exception. They look like they've come from a different engine and they're both slightly different. When I was setting the timing, I was very careful to make sure that the valve travel was correct. But even with correct valve travel, the mechanics of this engine do not allow it to be perfectly even in forward and reverse, but it's pretty good, I've seen a lot worse. Time now to tighten everything up in the bottom end of the engine. It's vital not to go mad when you do this and over tighten something and shear a bolt or worse strip a thread. So be very careful if you're doing this job, it's not a car engine, you do not need a torque wrench, just feel your way in. Do not over tighten anyway because it will distort the brasses, then you will not get a true bearing surface. It's very much an experience thing, and if you get it right, it runs like this. Now 
there is a little bit of end float on the crankshaft, but I can live with this. It seems to be running quite well. And the engine appears to be tight in certain places, so the more it gets run, the better it will bed in. A quick word about lubrication. When running a steam engine under steam, the lubrication is entirely different to the lubrication required when running a steam engine under compressed air. Steam cylinder oil is very thick and it's designed for superheated steam which is at a very high temperature. When running a steam engine on compressed air, the compressed air actually makes the engine very cold. If I'm using a very small steam engine, I will use steam oil for lubricating all of the parts of the engine. That's the crankshaft, the big ends, the little end and the cylinders. That's because a small steam engine gets very hot all over very quickly. Whereas with a larger engine like the one I'm working on, it doesn't work like that. The crankshaft area will be at a lower temperature, so steam oil is a little bit thick. What I actually do is mix my own. I will mix an oil using steam oil, machine oil and some rapeseed oil, which I'm told is very good for low friction. It's perfectly acceptable to use machine oil on the bottom end of an engine that's running on compressed air. Never use any machine oil in the cylinders if you're using an engine with silicone piston rings as the additives in the oil will attack the silicone and it makes the silicone very sticky. If you use just machine oil on the bottom end of an engine it will rattle a little bit. Steam oil does tend to cushion everything and make the engine run slightly quieter. As you can see this is a really large engine. Two two inch bore cylinders fitted with silicone piston rings now. You can easily see the size of the engine when compared to a Stuart number no. 10. A Stuart number no. 10 is a very small engine anyway, only about 6 inches high, but it really is dwarfed by this monster. Before I started the rebuild, I was asked by the owner of the engine if I could fit a mirror underneath the crankshaft. And this I did, but when the mirror was in one piece and difficult to remove, I found that cleaning it to remove the oil spots that are inevitably going to come from the crankshaft caused me to graze my knuckles on the crankshaft itself. So in the end I went for two easily removable mirrors, very easy to take out and clean. So after filling the three lubricators with some oil, I'm going to keep the needle valve shut on all of them and just put a spot of oil in the sight window at the bottom. The main reason for the engine seeming to be a little bit on the rattly side is that things are not very tight in the bottom end. And this is due to the fact that the owner of the engine doesn't have a proper compressor. With its two 2 inch bore cylinders this engine is very powerful indeed. And if it was being used in an environment like a boat, a full size boat, then these lubricators could have the needle valves opened and they would function as proper gravity fed sight feed lubricators. As can be seen here the engine runs quite well in both forward and reverse gear. Unfortunately, as the eccentrics are keyed onto the crankshaft and therefore they are not adjustable at all, I cannot tweak the engine to make it run really well. But it runs well enough, and I'm sure it will give many years of trouble free use. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.